I'd like to sing an old song for you called Gotham Lullaby. You know, I'll never forget that first recording session, as long as I live. There I was recording for UCM singing Gotham Lullaby. I think I was in some kind of state. And um, we you know, finished the first take, and he said, oh, this is wonderful. And he was dancing in the, in the um, control room. And I said, but don't you hear that my voice cracks in this place and that place? And he said, Meredith, if you want to do it again, I'm going out to have a cup of coffee. So he went to have a cup of coffee. I laid down another track. It was technically perfect, but really it didn't have that spirit, that, that kind of magic that that first take had. And I always respect Manfred so much for that, you know, because he, you know, you can edit yourself out of existence and get everything right, but there is something about the emotional continuity and there are vulnerabilities in a lot, a lot of my recordings, but I think there's some kind of truth about that. And, and he really goes for life, life itself which is not so perfect all the time. Well, the late 70s, I recorded Tablet, which was a piece that I made for me and three other female singers, uh, and Songs from the Hill, which were solo a cappella pieces, and I did send them to Manfred, uh, because Colin Walcott was already recording for ECM, and he was a very dear friend, and he had been the producer of my first two albums. And so Manfred wrote me back, this was, I think, 1978, and he said that he knew my, my work. He was not ready to have a singer on the label yet. And then we recorded Dolman Music here in New York with Colin producing in a little tiny studio, Hometown Studios. And we sent him just a, you know, a kind of rough mix. And then from there, I prepared the first side, which was some of my solo pieces that I had been working on for quite a while, actually, by that point. Because some of those pieces, Gotham Lullaby I wrote in 1974. So that would have been, by the time I recorded with Manfred, it was 1981. So um, that was nice because I had performed them for so many years and I was comfortable with them. And Dolman music I had composed in 1979, so it wasn't so old, but we had performed it many times. I had been wanting to record them for a long time and um, it just wasn't the right opportunity. I mean, I just feel that sometimes you, don't know when things don't work out that actually it's the best thing because maybe the right thing is going to come at a certain point later. So there was, it just, it was the right thing at the right time. Uh, you know, I, I knew it. I knew that, that ECM was the right home for Dolma music. It just felt like that was right. Manfred Eicher would say I'm definitely a studio shy musician. I'm very, very nervous as in the studio. It's not my happiest time of life. I feel like I'm, I'm more comfortable with an audience. And over the years with him, with ECM, I mean, I feel like we've gotten some really, really good recordings. I was trying in Dolma Music to get a feeling of, you know, a very old reality, but also, you know, a, you could say a very futuristic kind of interplanetary feel to it. I like to have a very ancient and very futuristic feeling simultaneously. <laughs> I really don't like that one has to sit and listen to words all the time when really all the other faculties are not being used. That I really don't like. 
I mean, I think the word has its own beauty and also should have its own integrity, stand alone just as much as any of the other elements. But in dolmen music, it's funny, I never think about that because my feeling was much more as if you were overhearing some mysterious conversation that you couldn't make it out. You couldn't make out the language and you couldn't make out the, you know, what they were saying and you were hearing it from far away. I went to Sarah Lawrence College here in America and I was in the voice department. I was studying leader, I was in the opera workshop, um, and I was making very simple piano compositions and vocal compositions. Um, but at the same time, I was earning my way through school folk singing. I had a guitar and I was singing for children's birthday parties and I loved the folk tradition. You know, I felt that, I think when I first came to Sarah Lawrence, I even thought I was going to be a folk singer. I mean, you know, that was never going to be because I feel like I always wanted to make my own work. So, you know, always, from the time I was maybe about 12 years old, I felt like I knew that I needed to create my own world. I came from a singer's background. My mother was a singer, and my grandfather was a singer, and my great-grandfather was a singer. So the musical part was something that was very natural to me. And maybe I had to also find my way a little bit out of that for part of my childhood because of having these singers, you know, where was I going to find my way? So during my childhood, I was dancing, I was playing piano very early, writing little piano pieces, and I was singing. Even through high school, I was singing and I was dancing. I mean, I was doing a theater. I mean, all these interests, playing guitar. And then when I went to Sarah Lawrence, I, um, I was in both the voice and the dance department and a little bit of theater. And I think in around my junior or senior year, um, I knew that somehow for my, what would I say, my psychic health or something as a human being, it was very instinctive that I wanted to try to figure out ways of, of perhaps weaving these elements together into one form. And the 12 year old revelation was more, I think I realized at that point, I think I'd made one, it was sort of choreography, but I also did a vocal thing with it and I did a painting, you know, to fulfill this thing. And it was very different than it, what anybody else did. And I, I think I used to think that my uniqueness was kind of a curse or something like that. I felt so, so like an outsider and I thought it was an insult. And now I realize, why did I think that? You know, I think that, you know, I'm always interested in people that are very unique and they're very themselves, you know, and that they found themselves and they stay with themselves. So I think when I was 12, it was much more a feeling of, I realized that being an interpretive artist was not going to be what I would do, that I needed to make something, that I, I enjoyed making things, I enjoyed creating. So then in my senior year at Sarah Lawrence, they allowed me to do what was called a combined performing arts program, where I was in the voice department and the dance and the theater department, and that was my main studies. And then there was a point in the mid-60s, after I had graduated from college, that I did have the revela a revelation about the voice. Because when I first came to New York, I, my work was much more gestural, and I was working a lot in art galleries doing solo pieces with a little bit of vocal work, but not full out singing as much, and I missed it. So I sat down at, at the piano and I just started doing my regular Western European vocalizing, and I had a revelation one day um, that the voice could be like an instrument, and that I could work with my voice the way that I, I did with my body, to, you know, to make my own unique kind of choreography, that I could do the same thing with my voice. That within the voice were male and female, animal, vegetable, minerals, landscape, uh, feelings that we don't have words for, you know, very in-between feelings that we label. I was very aware of the ancient power of the voice um, and, I all, and that I could also use different ways of producing sound, um, you know, the breath as part of a song, very nasal kind of uh, resonance and pull out my range. That was the first thing that I really worked on, very high and very low. And, um, and then also I had the sensation that I was coming back to my bloodline, you know, to my family bloodline. 
and that that was, um, you know, I was coming in my own way, and I knew that it was going to be the emotional heart of my work because I had already by that point done some large, what you would call multimedia pieces um, with, a, a, you know, some singing in it, but not, you know, as extended. And um, so from that point on, the exploration of my voice, you know, my, as an instrument was the center of my work and has been up to this day. And I think as the years went by, I started getting less interested in this kind of theatricality and much more interested in just the music itself. And then started getting very interested in just doing music concerts. You know, my whole spectrum, I feel, you could get in a music concert. And a lot of that came, you know, right around the time I was, um, started recording for ECM. We'd like to do a very old song from the 70s, 1975. Um, it's called The Tale and it's about an old woman bargaining with death. It's a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> I still have my hands. <laughs> so the idea of taking what would be a song form, which has a kind of chorus and a verse, you could say, even though some of those songs don't, they don't have that structure, uh, the early songs that I was working on, but it still was the idea of a song. And then with Tablet, as I said, it was almost a half an hour long, so then that was a much more extended composition, and then Dolma Music was the same kind of thing. So in a way, Dolma Music, I mean, I feel like uh, listening to it now, I, I, you know, where I feel like it really works is the fact that it is sectional, but the sectionals have a lot of relationship to each other, and you know, there's also a lot of circling or spiraling back to some of the earlier material, which I always love that in composition, that it's not linear, but it has, it's spiralic. And I feel like I use that a lot in my work. Uh, I still have my philosophy. What I usually do when I record with Manfred is I recompose things. You know, sometimes I compress the forms a little bit if they were longer to be able to incorporate, say, the movement aspect or something like that. And then sometimes I enrich them in terms of layering. I might even invite one or two more singers to join us in the recording just to, I need maybe a thicker kind of sound. So I do that so that the experience that you have as a listener is as rich as what you would see in, in the live performance. We recorded Dolma Music in New York, but then Manfred remixed it, though. It was quite different than the mix that we had sent him, you know, which he really likes to do because, for example, even with a piano album uh, called Piano Songs that we made a few years ago, we recorded it in here in Boston in a beautiful concert hall. And then uh, when, when Manfred remixed it, it just sounded, I mean, it sounded beautiful when we sent it to him, but it really sounded beautiful with what he did with it. It was gorgeous. And um, so, I mean, he, you know, he, a producer, I think, has a lot of influence in a recording session. You know, uh, he does. I mean, he, in a way, I mean, Colin and I used to always say Manfred's another member of the ensemble, you know, because, gee, I mean, it, it, how he's hearing, I mean, I remember when CDs came in and he and I were also, we were a little sad that vinyls weren't going to be around anymore because of the visual aspect. You know, because both of us are film people and, you know, and visual people. And so we always love the way that, a, you know, that a vinyl looked. But there was something that I understood when CDs came out that I never heard in the same way uh, before about the way Manfred works. It was that I heard more what, that he sculpts space. There was something in the CD form that I could hear the spatial sculpting more than I could in the vinyl. And now I'm sure if I go back to the vinyl, I'll hear it. 
But, you know, that's the thing that is, I think is so unique with him and, and remarkable. He's kind of a spatial sculptor. That's the way I think of, of him. Because the spatial thing is so amazing. Like um, uh, Songs of Ascension, we recorded in a, and he, he was there, and we recorded in a very beautiful um, old concert hall that they don't use for live performances anymore. So we had um, a 90 person chorus, and they were in, sitting in the seats. And then we were up on the stage, and to get that, you know, the depth that he could get, like in the recording, um, you know, I think I think it just added so much dimension to the piece. I think that's why I've been on this journey with Manfred all these years, because I feel that our values are very similar. We are interested in timelessness, mystery, magic, what you can't label, the ineffable. You know, I feel like we both are interested in that. And it manifests in different ways. I mean, I do like to also sometimes have some of my work have a very earthly quality. So I feel like I'm working with these different realms. So some of it does have more of this expansive quality, but some of it has a roughness because we have to also acknowledge our imperfections and our humanness, you know, our bodiness, our messiness, you know, that quality, because otherwise there's something unreal about it. So I think some pieces have more of one quality and some pieces have more of the other quality. You know, people ask me that, I remember John Cage asking me that, where did these voices come from, Meredith? I was just like, it's just a mystery. You know, I work, I work very hard. I go into the studio every day and work, and I feel like I just keep on trying to find new ways of using the voice, and then I think that these spirits or these phrases or these musical ideas just come through me. The material comes up in a very intuitive way, and then when I structure it, then I'm using another part of my mind to make a structure that I'm happy with. You know, the generation of material is just um, in a way like automatic writing or imp improvisation. I mean, just uh, working with the voice and then seeing what happens. And then if there's a tiny little thing that I like, then I'll keep that. So I always think, I always say it's like being a detective. I'll get a little clue of something that I haven't done before. I, I like to, uh, you know, I've worked for over 50 years, and I think what gives me pleasure is, is the moments of discovery. So I like to put myself into risk situations where I try to find something that I've never done before, I haven't heard before, and then I get excited. I, usually when I'm working on a new piece, I'm quite scared, even after all these years. And then I start working, and I'll find one tiny little thing. I'm always saying step by step, I always say that to myself. and you know, reminding myself to be playful with it, you know, not take it so seriously. And also, beginner's mind, go in with nothing, you know, go in with no expectation at all. And then I'll find one little thing, and then my fear of hanging out in the unknown starts getting surpassed by curiosity. And then when that happens, I know I'm on the right track. Working for many years, you know more of your patterns of, um, what would I say, delusion. <laughs> and you know when you're on your truthful path. And that's all I've wanted to do in my life, is to stay on my path, for better or for worse. I mean, I think it's a full-time job. And um, my big wish that I've always had is to want to be creating until I 
leave the planet and finding new things. And I just feel like I've been so blessed, you know, that I'm still singing, feeling really good. Not very good today because I sang two nights in a row and my voice is a little tired, my speaking voice is tired, but uh, I feel still very good. And, um, and I feel like I'm getting ideas that are still interesting me. And so I just, you know, it's, it's just a blessing to be in music. It's a blessing. <laughs>